if you could please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to Stephen Leibowitz. First of all, how many of you even remember American Bandstand? I mean, that's a sad state. Pardon? Dick Clark was there. I was, uh, I was, I grew up in Pittsburgh. And I came here to go to Emory, but in Pittsburgh, they taught you how to dance. So, you know, what can I tell you? I was on American Bandstand. And I also danced last year for the, uh, Alzheimer's Association when they did Dancing with the Stars. So it was a quite a treat for an old guy like me. Uh, I, like I said, am from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I came to Emory Law School. And uh, I was a litigator for a number of years. As a matter of fact, for about 19 years. And uh, then my uh, partner uh, was going to run for mayor of Atlanta. And he asked me to become his chief of staff. Now, I had never spent a day in government beforehand. I was very naive. I had been, like I said, a litigator. And I went down to City Hall trying to be chief of staff of the city of Atlanta, really with, in 1993, with the Olympics coming in 1996. I promised the mayor at the time that I would do it for two years through the Olympics. But within a few days of me coming down to City Hall, there was a quote in the Atlanta Business Journal Constitution. At that time, it had a large readership. And uh, uh, it says, Hawk's going to fly the coop. Hawk's going to fly the coop. So, the mayor looked at me and said, this is your project. Because if Phillips Arena was to move to Gwinnett County, and that's where they were thinking about going, it would have met the death knell of downtown. And probably some of you don't remember in the mid-90s and the early 90s, downtown was dying. And it was a major concern of everybody, especially with the Olympics coming. That was my first taste of a public-private partnership. That was my first taste of it. You're hearing about it today all over the place. And really, what does a public-private partnership mean? What does it mean? It really means the business and government working together to make certain that a project is completed. And it means, and it takes on many, many different shapes and sizes. And what it's meaning lately is government is taking on a lesser role and the private sector is taking on a greater role. And when you think about this, think about the fact that this should be a love affair. At this stage of our life, of this stage of where we are in the economy, public-private partnerships makes all the sense in the world. Governments don't have money. But what they have is land and control and the ability to give incentives. And the private sector has money and ingenuity. But they need, even to be able to get their financing, the ability to say that the government where a project is going to be taking place is coming together and going to be with me. So it should be a love affair. And I'm going to talk to you about a few of those and they mentioned some of these projects. And I'm going to talk to you about one, a public-private partnership that you're going to see in this area. Because uh, everything, all the big projects that you're hearing about in Atlanta are going to be in some way, in some form, a public-private partnership. And the last, I'm going to talk to you about what I think is going to ultimately be a, a public-private partnership. And that is the t -Splost. How many of you have heard of the Transportation Investment Act of 2010. Well, you're going to be hearing a lot about it. And I'm hoping by the time that I'm finished today, you're going to want to look more into it because it's your future if you intend to stay in Atlanta. This is probably one of the most important items that is going to be before our voters in July 
that's going to affect all of us, but especially you all who are going to want to stay here afterwards when you graduate. Now, whenever I talk about a public-private partnership, it always reminds me of a story. And the story goes like this. There was a reverend, and the reverend, his wife had passed, and he had to take care of his teenage son. And he was worried about his teenage son. He just didn't know what was going to become of him. He was acting up, doing different things. So he came up with this very ingenious idea. And this ingenious idea was he was going to put a Bible, money, and a bottle of whiskey into the kid's room. And he was going to stand behind the door and watch. And he figured if the son came in and he took the Bible, then he said he was going to be all right. He's going to be a reverend like me. And if the son came in and he took the money, he was ah, not going to be a reverend, but he's going to be an entrepreneur. He'll still be OK. But if the son comes in and takes the whiskey, I know I got big problems. I know I got huge, big problems. So sure enough, he lays it all out there. He goes in, hides behind the closet. Son comes home from school, throws his books on the bed, looks around the room, goes and sees the Bible, starts licking and picking it up, going through it, puts it under his arm, sees the money, picks my can't believe it, sticks his right in his pocket, sees the whiskey, goes over opens it up and just swigs it. And you hear from the closet, oh my god, he's going to be a politician. <laughs> Public-private partnerships. And we, we a lot alluded to one in the beginning. I was the chief of staff of the city when the Phillips Arena was, uh, was being conceived. And think about this so that you guys just get a little bearing on it. We have a situation where the population is really not coming as much to downtown. We have a growing pop population in Gwinnett County. The team at that point in time thinks about and wants to go where the population is because they're in the, the, the ability to make money. They've got bad, bad infrastructure and around that, and they need, you know, and they need a new arena. City doesn't have the money to build them a new arena. So what, how do you work that? How do you see how a public-private partnership works? Well, the city and the Hawks were able to say, here's what we'll do. The city had the land, and we'll give the land for 30 years to the Hawks to be able to utilize. And the city had the ability, interestingly enough, and it's a little known story, one of the great stories, that there were all of this money that was needed for infrastructure to change right in front of the, the arena is now, where Techwood would, would Park Road is, or whatever that is. And what happened was, city didn't have money for that, and what happened was they raised a car rental tax by 1%. And they worked really hard on it. The legislature understood what this meant. But the interesting thing about it was all the car rentals were in College Park, not in the city of Atlanta. So in order to get the money, the city of Atlanta and College Park had to enter into an intergovernmental agreement of which very few people even knew about. But for the first years of this, 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 this particular fund, this money, the extra taxes, went to the city of Atlanta to pay off the bonds for all the infrastructure that was going to be taking place. And the Phillips and the, and the College Park, now after the bondsmen pay off, they got the revenue. And College Park was smart enough to understand that if they didn't do something, College Park was going to hurt as well. So then the Hawks understood that this was really important for downtown. And they understood that the city didn't have any money. So 
They needed the city to bond because they came in at a lower interest rate, but they agreed to pay for everything. And that was an incredible deal at the time for the city of Atlanta. And they also promised at the time to bring the hockey team, which they did. Unfortunately, they didn't promise to keep it forever, but they promised to keep it at the time and bring one, and they did. So that was a really the beginning of understanding what it takes to make a public-private partnership. And then you take a look at the Atlantic Station, which is right next to you, and you think about that project. Think about that project. An old steel mill, abandoned, water and sanitary sewer problems, a brown field. Who is going to fix that up? Why would you fix that up? They tried to do it during the Olympics. Nobody wanted a piece of that. Nobody could get there. Why would a developer come and say, I want to work on this particular project, unless there was some economic incentives, unless the public did something to recognize that we need to attract development to that section. How are we going to do it? The mayor was thoughtful enough at the time to look and see and really put together a task force to look for different financing mechanisms. And has anybody take finance here? Anybody heard of tax increment financing? Okay. Well, well, we'll talk about that just a little bit. But what the, what the city had to do was come up with a novel way to get a developer to do this. Because the developer had to put streets in and fix all the water and the sewer issues and clean up the environmental issues. And why would somebody on new land do that? And think about at, this t at the time what this project was. There were, at the time, it was paying taxes to the city of Atlanta, Fulton County, and the school board, the amount of $320,000. Total. That was it. Every year, that's what they were getting. So a developer, Jacoby, had a dream. He said, I can put this together, but I need help. So we looked for different financing techniques, and we came up with creating a tax allocation district. And a tax allocation district around the country is known as the tax increment financing. But in Georgia, it's a tax allocation district. Two long reasons to go into why, but that's neither here nor there. And what that is is this. Ingenious. You create a redevelopment area, and they did, right around the 130-some acres of Atlantic Station. And they put and say, the taxes that are coming into the system now stay. But any new development that comes into this particular area, the taxes generated from that can go back into the project. So that way, if in fact when they first built the Dillard's or the office building, those increased taxes could go back into a special fund to be utilized by the developer to put back into the project. A very big deal at the time. We have used it now all over the city of Atlanta. As a matter of fact, Atlanta has used up its allocation of bonds. But think about what this did for the city of Atlanta. I was told you that at the time, it was paying $320,000. Today, when it's 45% built out, which means it's, it's got a ways to go, it's producing over $20 million in taxes. And by the time this is all built out and the bonds are paid, it will be producing about $40 million in taxes. But here we got the developer. He needed to take a chance. We have a city that I only have, they don't have any money, but they have the incentives to be able to do this. And so we were able to put that together to do what's an unbelievable project. Whether you like it or not, 
whether there are good things and then you like the restaurants or you don't like the restaurants. It's a unbelievable, unbelievable example of what can be done when you are working together. And I want to put one more thing in there. In order to make it work, it was required by the federal government that there be a bridge across the, where you see the 17th Street Bridge now. That bridge, I would say to you, changed Atlanta. It connected the east and west side of Atlanta like it's never been connected and all this development that's occurring on the west side right now is because that bridge opened and that was working with the state and the state put about $70 million in that project. And the city of Atlanta and their TADBODs put about $250 million in the project. But a drop in the bucket to what it's really going to be producing and what it's worth. Now think about this. Let's talk about the present. What projects do we have coming up here? What are you hearing about? You hearing about a new Falcon football stadium? If there's a new Falcon football stadium, you can bet that's going to be a public-private partnership that they're going to put together to be able to do that. You can bet that the Falcons are going to put in a lot of money into that deal, and the, and the government, which doesn't have it, is going to be working something to be able to make that work. You hear about Fort McPherson and Fort Gillum, the two army bases that are closing. Huge economic development projects for this particular region have to be done by public private foreign. Has to be. No other financing to be able to do it for it. You're reading about the multimodal, which is going to be downtown. A couple, a year or so ago, a team was chosen to study how this multimodal in the Gulch can be, can be made to be a, a, a great thing. I mean, do most people here support transit? Yes or no? Hands, who supports transit? Who doesn't? Not all the hands went up, but I don't see so well, so maybe. Uh, the multimodal I mean, is going to be a huge development project. Who's heard about the Beltline? Beltline. It's going to have money that's going to come in from a number of different sources, but you can bet. They formed a tax allocation district around the Beltline, but you can bet that that's going to have to be a public-private partnership to make it work. And now, let's talk about what I consider to be the most important project that I really want to convince you that it should be an important project for you. It's the Transportation Investment Act of 2010. It's called t -SPLOS. What this, does anybody think that our roads are congested? Yes or no? Yes. Does anybody think that we need in this region economic development? Do we need more jobs? Does anybody, does anybody disagree with that? Does anybody disagree with Atlanta has really, the metro Atlanta really, has taken a hit? And we have been hit hard by the real estate crisis. We have been hard by a lack of jobs. Our unemployment is higher than most around the, the region in the country. Does anybody disagree with that? OK. Then pay attention. The t splost is this. There is a vote in July of this year when the primaries come. And the vote is this. The state, for the first time, has been divided into regions. There are 12 regions. There is one metro region consisting of the 10-county metro region. The Kent County metro region is the DeKalb and Cobb and Gwinnett, et cetera, Fulton, Henry. And, they've, and this is, you have the right, we will have the right to vote for a penny sales tax 
to be utilized strictly for transportation projects in our region. In other words, it won't go to be divided around the state. Each region has the election. If a region wants it and they do it, the money collected in that sales tax in that area will be kept in that area. There have been 157 projects that are on an approved list. And what's historic is they had a 20-member board of regional politicians coming together and unanimously voting on what projects needed to get done. And they had a criteria, and the criteria was, one, can we get it moving within 10 years? And two, is it really going to help relieve congestion? And it's interesting. The, I said there was unanimous agreement, but there's still, there's still people complaining about some of the projects. Some of you, do any of you live in Cobb County? Cobb County? Well, you know, there was a, there's a project in Cobb County that is supposed to be rail, that is to come down from Cobb County to Atlantic Station. And that was one of the agreed upon projects, but apparently because of what happened with the, uh, uh, the, Gov the Cobb County people don't want that project anymore and they'd like to use it for construction. And there's going to be other people don't like the fact that the Beltline is one of the projects going to receive an awful lot of money. And the reason that they don't like that is because they don't see the Beltline as really a congestion reliever. They see it as more as a developmental project. But this is going to be bring, if it's passed, $8 billion to the states, to, this, to the region, excuse me, in the 10 years that it'll exist. $8 billion with a B. And it will be divided up as the projects have been agreed upon. And 15% of that, by the way, of those monies collected will be given back to each jurisdiction so that they can use it for projects that are not necessarily funded by the TSPLOST. So what does that mean? Well, it means if this goes forward, even if you don't like the, all the projects, think about what this means for economic development. 200,000 jobs is the first estimate of what's going to happen if this were to pass. Think about the jobs for the engineers who haven't been working. Think about the jobs for the construction industry that's been out of work for years. 35,000 construction jobs predicted in the first three or four years of this an economic boom where we haven't seen cranes or anything out there in a long time, we have the ability to have absolute, a great economic situation here where there's building going all over the place. And that's why it's important to you guys. You guys got to get behind this. Especially, like I said, if you're staying in Atlanta and you don't want to deal with congestion, which is only going to get worse, there is no plan B, folks. If this doesn't pass, we just get more and more congestion. I don't know how many of you know this, but you, when you drive a car, the only money that goes to fixing up your roads is some money we get from the federal government dwindling and the money we get from the gas tax. But think about it. People are driving more efficient cars. They're not driving as much. They hate the traffic. Gas tax is going down. We don't have the money to be able to fix this dilemma that the state is in. If this doesn't pass, that we are going to see it more and more congested. And I'll tell you something. Congestion doesn't do anything about bringing businesses to this region. 
And that's another thing that all of you should be thinking about as well how you can participate and how, how important it is to, to see this area grow. And so that's why, in my opinion, I wear this button very proudly and hope that we will see more and more of you voting because here's the deal. There are a lot of people who are anti-tax. Just anti-tax. And this is a vote in the primary in July, so it's not going to be a huge turnout. So it is very important that the ones who understand the value of what this means to our state, the public-private partnership that will be created, because believe me, if these projects get started, this is just a tip in the iceberg of what will go on following that. So I'm sort of passionate about it because I have been involved in seeing government and the private sector work for a long time. That's what I do at my law firm. And it's interesting because, like I said, I do it in so many different ways. I work on baseball stadiums. I work on development projects. I work on issues that, that are far different, but they always resolve around, revolve around the intersection of business and government. And I think all of you, as your careers take off, are going to see that there's a much more of an integration in just about everything you do. So with that, I want to open it up for questions. I think I'm on the thing, and I hope that uh, yeah, you learn something. Hi, this is really random compared to the speech that you were talking about, but when we were introduced, they mentioned a project in San Diego, and I was just wondering how you got involved with that and how that connected, as you've done a lot of work in Atlanta, so. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, but it was interesting because when I worked in the city, I worked on the, representing the city on the Atlanta, I mean on the Phillips Arena project, when I left and went to the private sector, the city of San Diego called me because they felt like I had an understanding of government so that I could represent them in their negotiations on the private, with the private sector attorney. So I worked with the city there in San Diego as well. It was fascinating, really. I do a couple of other baseball stadiums, too. Baseball stadiums are interesting work. Uh, to me, one of the more unfortunate qualities of Atlanta is a lack of urban planning and how spread out and kind of there's this very large sprawl. And to me, the Beltline is a real key factor that could help turn that around. And I was wondering to you, like, there's this, there's this pattern of a uh, culture in Atlanta that doesn't really embrace those kind of ideas. And so to you, what, what do you feel like are the main things in Atlanta and Georgia culture that kind of pre prevents this development? What prevents this development? Yeah. Well, you know, I think, interestingly enough, I think the Beltline is going to go. I, I think the, there has been a lot of, of, oh, I guess, naysayers about whether this is really a transportation project or a development neighborhood parks and rec project. So there are naysayers about that. I personally am a believer. And in the event that this particular uh, t spas passes, the Beltline will get about $614 million towards making it a reality. So I think it will uh, help. And I think the way they are selling it and the way I hope it will be is there will be tie-in from the Beltline to the streetcar, you know, that's supposed to come up Peachtree Street. There will be tie-in to that. So it really could be tied into MARTA. It could be a very successful project. So uh, I'm hopeful that it will that work. I really am. Uh, with the new tax, it sounds like the government's trying to kind of solve the problem on their own. How does it come in with the, the public government partnership here? How is the public investing money and really doing this rather than government well, throwing the, money at the it? The investment of the money is the, you're taxing yourself. You're, the public is taxing itself to put this, these transportation monies out there. 
So unlike when you worked with industry before to get projects done, really this is just taking money through taxes to put back into it? Well, that's, you know, there are one ways. I mean, that's one way in this particular set of, 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 uh, of projects that it has to happen. Like I said, in other ways, sometimes the public has land that they might give, and the private sector finances the whole thing. Uh, I.e., you all heard about the... Um, what's happening around the airport with the Porsche moving down there. And, you know, that's going to be, I don't know if you all heard about that. It's going to be a great project. Porsche is moving their headquarters right next to the airport. It's going to have a track that you're going to be able to test and drive cars around. Mm -hmm. But they, there, you, I mean, there they used the land. They didn't use money. Thank you. Yes. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I, okay, go ahead. Um. There's like a huge difference between transit and transportation, and I think as like the the, the average citizen doesn't know that. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't I didn't hear your first part of your question. Um, I haven't. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Better. That's better. Um, there's a huge difference between transit and transportation, and I think the average uh, citizen doesn't know those things. Um, do you think it was a political tactic to put it um, the TIA bill on the summer primary, and how do you think that the um, how, like, what other ways can we educate the public about transit-oriented development that really needs to happen in the state of Georgia? Okay. Um, well, you know, taking the last question first, I think the educational process that you will see is coming. In other words, in the next couple of months, with regard to the t -SPLOS, you will see that that is going to be highly advertised you're going to be hearing about it, I hope, and you will hear more and more people talking about it. There is an arm of the Atlanta Chamber that is based for education, and there's one based for raising money and advocacy, and you will be hearing from the advocacy. You are so right about transit and transportation. Uh, the, and a lot of people don't understand this, and this is one of the big issues, and I'm glad you brought that up. One of the big issues is a lot of people I don't like transit or don't want transit. But interestingly enough, I think a lot of people recognize that if we are going to get ourselves out of the uh, jam that we are in, transit is going to be a necessary component. So of this t -SPLOS projects that have been chosen, about 51% are transit. Or, I mean, when I say transit, they are rapid transit. The other 47 or 48 percent are fixing roads in congestion. Like, are you, any of you live out in the area near Sandy Springs where they, where 400 comes into Sandy Springs? And, they, and that big interchange? No? No, you do? Well, you can imagine, you know, that's one of the targeted uh, roads to be changed over and that. But, so you're right, but a lot of people don't understand and that's going to be very, very important to be able to educate people on exactly what these projects are going to be. Did that, was that answer to answer your questions? Okay. Everything's political. Everything's political. That's for sure. Yes. Uh, several people I know that I've talked to about the Beltline in particular have expressed concern that it will turn into a MARTA type management system wherein it serves a very limited number of customers and it is overly expensive for those customers and it has a limited service. What will you do, what is the plan to uh, keep it from falling into that sort of management system? You know, I, I think that that's really premature because I don't think they've really planned uh, the Beltline transportation at all yet. So I don't know where you're hearing those, those comments but it would seem to me that they're, you know, misplaced because the, believe me, what's going, you're going to see happen is, if anything, MARTA may lose its identity and come into what's called a greater regional transportation. And they may fall under what's now known as Greta. And I, I don't think you're going to see MARTA taking over any type of, 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 uh, the belt line or anything like that. But again, it's very premature because it really hasn't been, you know, transportation hasn't really been planned yet. Yes. 
Steve, you mentioned that um, Oops. in the public-private uh, projects that the, that the city has land and uh, incentives, basically that's their chip, so they put on the table primarily. And I, I guess, could you give us some examples, perhaps, of that aren't necessarily real estate related, but where perhaps the public and private partnerships could be extended, where those chips, particularly the incentive chips, could be used to uh, help entrepreneurs create new businesses to create jobs that way rather than through real estate development? Well, let's think. Uh, the privatization of any of the services that the city is looking to potentially privatize. Uh, fleet management uh, being one, where they're thinking about going out to try to do that, which would create jobs, be more efficient potentially to do something like that. Uh, energy audits. Uh, you know, they need, they need people to come in there. If this private sector would be able to come in there and assist with energy audits, that may, uh, uh, you know, do something. I mean, that's sort of a public-private partnership. Not quite the same thing. Um, I, I don't know that I'm touching on everything that you want. What do you... Infrastructure, real estate, bigger, bigger projects, I think, but I think there's a smaller way. Fulton County wanting to privatize its medical clinics. I mean, there's a number of ways that that's still a public-private partnership. It's yeah. just a different kind of public-private partnership well, than we were talking about. Right. Well, I mean, you know, you know, I think the ADA is trying to sit down there and try to come up with the problem is they don't have any funding to try to come up with entrepreneurs and to assist entrepreneurs in different things. But it's very difficult. So one example at the state level might be the ATDC. We've talked about that in our class before, the Advanced Technology Development Center. It was a joint activity between the state government and the private sector where the private sector said, if you build this facility, we'll come in and become mentors round up venture capital and help these startup companies begin. That's, that's one non-real estate kind of example. Right. Is this one? Okay. Um, you said that you talked a little bit about how it's going to be divided up into regions, and then that region's tax money is going to be spent on transportation there. Um, but you said our region included Gwinnett, which is huge. So have you guys thought about any way that you're going to, like which projects you're going to do first? Yes. Or? The, 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 way, the way it was is in this. Gwinnett, everybody came in in this region. You're exactly right. Gwinnett is huge. Fulton is huge. We have the largest region. No question about that. But they all came in with their wish list of projects. And then it was whittled down. And so they, nobody got everything they wanted. As a matter of fact, some of the issues that still exist is, for instance, DeKalb County really wanted to have a line extended at MARTA out on I-20. They didn't get that. They're not happy about it. So nobody got everything they wanted. The projects that will be done first, supposedly, are those that can be done the quickest because they want the economic generation of these things starting right away. But my guess is that if a project's going to take longer, they're going to have to get the planning and everything else for that done as well. So the way they have it set up at this point in time as Greta, which is the overall potential transportation arm, will take care of all the, be the overseer of the transit projects. And the Georgia Department of Transportation will be the overseer of all the road projects. Yes? Can you ex can you explain the penny tax? Pardon? Better. Can you explain that penny tax that you were talking about? The penny tax. Yeah. Okay, the penny tax is what we were talking about. The penny tax is a sales tax. A sales tax. And it, for any, so when anything that you purchase, not, I, don't, I, I think food is exempted, but if you, when you purchase something, there will be another penny put on, on your purchase. On each, well, if you have $55 in, in uh, uh, purchases, another penny will be put on to what you previously had. 
So it will be that will be added. But the good thing about this is, and what doesn't happen usually, is that all of this money that is collected from this penny will go back into the region, the ten county region, and they will have the use of that money for the projects that we just discussed. So before, where it would go to many different places, this is earmarked so that it does what it's supposed to accomplish. And that, I think, is very important and very historical. Really. Steve, you've given us a lot of education on these different projects. Can you, can you talk about what you actually do with MLA and what your role in these projects are? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Thank you. Um, I wonder myself sometimes. Um, our, our, we have a governmental practice, and we, we're one of the few large firms in the, te in the city that, that does this and it focuses on this. And this is sort of the intersection of business and government. And what we do, and I am in the local and state area. We have a federal government area, and we have a state and local government area, and, we, and I work in the state and local government area. But what, I, what we do is, and I can only give you an example of a project. We are representing the people at Fort Gillum. Fort Gillum is a project now that you will hear about. It is the base in Forest Park that has closed up and the Army is leaving. So you can imagine Fort McPherson, which is in the city of Atlanta, and Fort Brack, I mean Fort Gillum, both closed. And when this leaves, think about this, all these Army guys leave, what does it do to a community? You know, all the people who used to go to those restaurants and go to those shopping centers and go to the things are gone. So now it is they basically you work out an agreement. And my job was, is to assist in the many different governmental issues that exist in trying to take this from the Army, to the private sector, to getting all the permitting and all the tax incentives that are necessary to make a project like this work. Working with the infrastructure, and because there's so many different infrastructure issues that it has to deal with. Because, like I said, any permitting issues that some of the developers will have, or procurement issues that they might have, all of that falls under the, the public-private partnership. So I really do that. And, and in that particular instance, in a, in a baseball stadium, when I negotiate baseball's name, I represent the county, and I'm trying to give them the best deal to protect them so that we try to transfer the risk from a public entity to a private entity. And of course, if I'm representing the private entity, I'm trying to give the public sector the risk. But, you know, that's, that's, what, that's what I do. I can represent both sides and have represented both sides. I have an understanding, obviously. Not at the, not at the same time. Not at the same time. Uh, this uh, issue that you're talking about is, is clearly important and it's a big quality of life uh, issue, but there are other quality of life issues uh, in the region, like education, like health care, no uh, like dealing in a humanitarian way with those who are developmentally disabled um, and harmed uh, when they're in the state's uh, care. How do we prioritize uh, what kinds of things we're going to vote on for this extra penny uh, tax? Uh, is this a better way of getting things done than deciding what the tax will be and then having our elected representatives with private uh, partners deciding what the priorities are for quality of life? Well, you know, that's a, obviously a very hard question and uh, uh, something that we all have to think about. But in our, in our lives, we, are, um, we all sort of have priorities. And I guess our legal, our representatives who are now at the legislature have set forth the priorities that they think the people of Georgia are, want. And this particular priority has come ahead of some of the other priorities that you've mentioned.
Now, it's my feeling for that in order to make Georgia a wonderful state, there are three critical areas that we have to deal with, transportation being one. But clearly, if we don't do something about our educational system, and if we don't do something about even water and what's going to happen on the water run, we've got many, many critical areas. But this, we shouldn't, in my mind, that shouldn't d dismiss the importance of this because this can take care of one of the critical areas. And I think that's why we all have to focus on this. But you're right. My God, we have issues. So many different issues if you work in government and you see it. There are, uh, there are a thousand. And all great causes. But you're, like I said, your representatives put out certain things that they prioritize. We elect them. And this one we shouldn't punish because this is the first one out. Stan, it's got a follow-on question. The General Assembly, the legislature, has the authority to add a penny sales tax. Why do you think they delegated this to the people through a referendum as opposed to deciding it themselves? Because it was very political. They didn't want to be, I mean, think about it. Our state is very anti-tax. And because of that, these guys didn't want, these legislatures were saying, hey, we, we want transportation. They had the ability to do it themselves. But they felt like if the people want it, then it, I'll put it on the ballot. But they didn't want to take the heat to pass it themselves. That's for sure. So that's why they did it this way. So my question is a bit more general. You put a lot of emphasis on public and private uh, cooperation. And just in the corporate sector, would you deal with mergers and acquisitions? There's a culture issue. What would you say is the greatest issue with public-private par partnerships? And uh, why you, you also mentioned that this is a more prominent thing now, having these partnerships. Is, it, is there a reason for that? Is it out of necessity? Well, I, th I think, first of all, it's definitely out of necessity now because uh, governments are much restricted. You know, federal largesse, where the federal government used to shower the cities and states with money, that has stopped. So out of necessity, local governments especially, but even the federal government, has to join forces with them. So I think that's, that's for sure. What's wrong with pro public private? If you don't, clearly one of the things that that's, has to be done are the agreements have to be looked at, thought through, and done correctly. Because you can be giving away certain things, one side more than the other. Probably government will be taken advantage of more than the private sector. And that's very important that the agreements are drafted and negotiated correctly, in my opinion. But that's the downside, because governments can be taken for uh, you know, for a bath, and I think what you saw is, if you've watched the fact that certain governments now are in trouble, a lot of municipalities, a lot of, you know, the, the idea of cities going bankrupt are now existing for the first time. Uh, uh, be, it, it's because they've been taken advantage of. And then it'll be a, st a statement. Um, uh, but uh, a public-private partnership that did not involve uh, real estate is the uh, Emory Georgia Tech uh, Biomedical Engineering Department, which is the only private school, public school um, arrangement of that kind um, in the um, in the country that I know of. And since that's happened, there's been a whole lot more attraction of, of government and industry funding for research, which uh, has uh, also contributed to hopefully the development of uh, the economy in terms of, um, of, uh, of jobs. Are all, so since I could turn this into a question uh, for you, are all of the uh, public-private partnerships that you deal with um, essentially uh, government uh, directly government par partnerships in some way some form or fashion but, yes okay so you your firm would not be engaged in a public private partnership between uni universities oh no oh no for sure no 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 for sure we would as a matter of fact we did when if you remember the 
the, the, was an army base up in Athens. And the army base closed in Athens and they built the medical school. We represent, we, that, that was a, with institutions. We do that all the time. Absolutely. Any other questions? Everybody's dying to get out of here. Let me just say one more thing to you. Uh, and uh, before you go, and this is something for you all to remember. Um, I think one of the things that my career demonstrates is that you don't know where life's going to take you. You can start off being one thing and just by chance do something else and find yourself in an absolutely different position than you ever thought you'd be in. And I think two things that I'm going to say to you. One is embrace that because I think it, it revitalizes you and it keeps you thinking and it keeps you, uh, you, you know, think, thinking in different ways. And, and uh, uh, two, don't be afraid of, of, of change uh, because, you know, changes can be really good. And three, for some of you thinking about careers, I want to tell you that I think spending some time in the public sector is a wonderful way to gain insight into what the private sector is all about. So I, and learning, which I didn't do, interestingly enough, I, it took me a long time uh, uh, before I really understood the private, the public sector. But it is a good thing for people who have the opportunity to get involved with. You feel good about it because doing public service work is really good and and heartwarming and fill and fulfilling but you also learn a real lot and it can help you in the private sector later on down the line thank you very much